Welcome to the Hamumu Halloween Home Horror Hoedown, the podcast where we watch scary movies so you don't have to. From award-winning to completely unknown, we take them all way too seriously. I'm your host, Mike Hommel. And I'm your host, Solange Hommel. Now warning, we use a ghoulish number of spoilers, so watch the movies first. Second warning, we don't know anything about anything, so don't take us seriously as we take these movies seriously. Welcome back to the Hamumu Halloween Home Horror Hoedown in Hooray! the middle of July. July Hoedown! <laughs> um, Soli, why are we doing it in the middle of July? Well, Mikey, the world is horror. The world is horror. Everything is falling apart, and the world is starting to feel very much like we are living uh, a dystopian, post-apocalyptic horror movie every single day. That's true. And so, why wait until October? There is no reason to wait. We might as well start talking about scary movies now. And it has the added bonus of relieving the pressure a little bit in October. Because right. personally, as the world burns down around me, I feel the need to dedicate more time to elections. And there's an election day on November 8th. So my October will be very busy. And you are very much involved in those things. So for both of us, this show takes over our lives throughout October. 100%. And it is good to spread that out. Just do one a week. We're going to commit to one a week through the end of October. Yes. And then after that, who knows? Who knows how much longer the world will last? Right? We, you know, they talk about, you know, fiddling as the Titanic sinks. Yeah. We will podcast as the world burns. <laughs> Great. Which might, if you hear noises in the background, that's the world burning. <laughs> the snap, crackle, and pop <laughs> of a delightful fire. Yeah. This is fine. This is fine. <laughs> Our first film for 2022 is something I've been dying to see ever since I saw a clip on YouTube or something showing how amazing the dialogue in this movie is. Amazing. That's an interesting word choice. I don't think it's the word choice the video <laughs> used, but we'll get into it. This movie is called Old from 2021. It is an M. Night Shyamalan movie. It is indeed. Which at one point in my life would have had me so excited. He yes. wrote innovative, interesting stories. He had a fascinating new perspective, changed the world of scary movies. And now? I I believe you suggested during this movie that he had some sort of progressive brain disorder. <laughs> they just seem to be getting worse. Everyone that comes out is a little bit less cohesive. The writing is a little bit more stilted. Like more so weird. I will tell you, this is the weirdest movie I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and there's different kinds of weird. Like, you know, there's things like where, whatever, creepy monsters and strangeness and mystery sure. and horror. This is not that kind of weird. Nope. This is a pretty basic kind of movie, but it's done in such an insane way <laughs> that it's like, yeah. what was anyone thinking on this set? Yeah. So it brings to mind the book Flowers for Algernon. And you know how the guy, the main character in that book, like, he suddenly gets really smart and then he loses what he retained. And during yeah. that loss point, he, like, knows he's losing. Yeah. This movie is written like someone who knows things but has lost the ability to access those things. <laughs> like, like, used to know exciting things about science and time and how to create a plot yeah but then like can't quite catch on to any of those things anymore <laughs> right i think the biggest thing that he's lost more than anything else is the ability to write human earth people dialogue absolutely right? several of my comments several of the notes that i made were me asking has the writer of this movie ever met a child has the writer <laughs> of this movie ever met a black person has the writer <laughs> of this movie ever met an elderly person like yes uh, this is a kind of a different issue but i took notes on lines from the first minute of this movie <laughs> yep there's i can't wait to hear your voice when you're older and then 
How old do you have to be to be a scuba diver? And then stop wishing away this moment. All of that crammed into the first minute. And I'm not saying those are like poorly written lines. I'm saying blinking red lights. Yes, it was. It's like when you when you teach someone something for the first time and then they're like trying to make it happen. Someone taught him about foreshadowing yeah. and he was like, is this what it's like? <laughs> so I'm going to put words in here that make people think about the things that come later. <laughs> and his teacher is just over there going, oh, I mean, I it's mean, technically it's close, right. <laughs> but no. <laughs> and sometimes it's hard to explain the subtleties. That's, I think subtlety is the important word. There mm-hmm. was none. And foreshadowing requires some kind of subtlety. Otherwise, it's just someone using a baseball bat on your brain. Yeah. Oh, my God. A little bit later. You're always thinking about the future. It makes me feel not seen. You're always thinking about the past. Oh, it's amazing. (sighs) It's just amazing. All the dialogue. Yeah. And even when he's not trying to foreshadow things... The dialogue all comes across like it's been routed through several iterations of, like, Google Translate. Yeah. Like, it (laughs) means the right things, but it's not done in a way that anyone who speaks that language would actually say it. Like, I knew about the weird talk about getting old and stuff and hugely foreshadowing. I didn't realize that watching this movie, we were going to hear so much about people's names and what they do for a living. That's most of the movie. What's his name? Jaren? How can you not remember (laughs) Jaren? My name is Jaren and I'm a nurse. How many times did he say that? There were a minimum of three of those, probably more. And then the best part was that the two thirds of the way through the movie, he's like, I'm (laughs) Jaren! Yes! I don't even know why he yelled it, but he was so mad that people didn't know he was Jaren. It was madness. And it started with the kid at the beach walking up to three complete stranger adults. Yes. Like just walking up and saying, What are your names and what do you do for a living? Oh, well, I'm Sophie Watson. I'm a chef. I'm Greg Mitchell. I'm a cop. Cool. And I'm Melly Mitchell. I'm a dancer. Wow, that's cool. Okay, bye. And, yes. of course, that was a plot point, because those were three random people who weren't in most of the movie. And then, oh, one of those what you do for a livings was real important. Uh-huh. Foreshadowing. Uh-huh. So, now, the fact that he said that he was a cop, that was appropriate foreshadowing. Right. It, it didn't seem to have any significance, but we it remembered. Was fine. If it had just been a precocious kid acting, asking a weird question, and these... If any of the adults had been like... <laughs> weird but okay like yeah, no they were just like this is normal was crazy they went yeah so weird yeah none of them were like where's your mom kid like it's leave like, me alone it's like we were watching blues clues yes, it is. <laughs> the other thing that really struck me as poor writing is that the thing about everyone's jobs because every character was like the living embodiment of their job they had the psychologist lady who Every line she said was like, this is the psychological issue happening here. Or let's form a trust circle. We should talk about how you feel about this. <laughs> the doctor who's like, I'm a doctor. Let me, you know, you can, you have to trust me. I'm a doctor. Yeah. And just everybody's job was so integral. At one point, the museum lady is like, I, I think it was because bodies were disintegrating. Guess what? Time's passing fast on this beach, everybody. The, <laughs> Spoilers. The, the museum lady was like, as somebody who works with, you know, mummified corpses and stuff, I can tell that bodies decay in seven years. So how does it decay so fast? Like, yeah. Why was it so tied to the job? It's it's like this weird obsession. Well, and you can see how they were like, okay, we need to have give them away to figure out how fast time is passing here. So then we're going to have this happen. And if that happens, then we need to have this person with this expertise. And so then we need to explain in advance that she is this person. And it was all just done like so mechanically instead of 
Like, there yeah. are ways that people's jobs come up in other conversation, but oh. there was no just random conversation. Everything, everything was working toward something that was going to happen later. Yeah, the the guy who was an insurance adjuster, and he just, like, he, he saw somebody climbing a rock cliff, and he's like, oh, 72% of people who climb rock cliffs fall down and die. And, and yeah. people are like, how do you know that? Well, I'm an insurance adjuster. My this name is, is Bob, thing. and I'm an insurance adjuster. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? This is not how people act. Yeah. On vacation. Right? <laughs> Wait, it's ironic to me that I'm complaining about the fact that every single thing that was said was said solely for the purpose of explaining something later. Because... I have often given the writing advice that everything you write, every <laughs> sentence you write should have some, like, should be having multiple purposes toward developing your story. Yeah. But again, it goes back to that word of subtlety. Like, there's a way to do it that that feels natural, that sounds natural, and this ain't it. No, this this truly ain't it. It sounds like an alien wrote this. Yes. How is it possible that the same person who wrote Signs, which is one of my most favorite horror, in quotation marks, movies, because mm-hmm. it's eh, minimally horrible. But how did that same person write that movie, which I love for the complexity of how all the different details that right. are revealed in the beginning all come together at the end? How did that person also write this movie? It's kind of the same in that it shows that he's really into crafting the plot, but somehow he let those people have natural things to say, and this time the plot is crafted, like, chunky. Very (laughs) chunky. I'm going to push back on that a little bit, because I see where there were efforts to craft the plot, but, like, in Signs, it works. It all comes together. Each piece is a piece to the puzzle that at the end you're like, oh, M G and in this one I see all the different threads of the plot but by the end we don't have a tapestry we don't no. have a finished puzzle we still just have a bunch of puzzle pieces all thrown on the table and maybe they've all been flipped right side up <laughs> but they're not in the right places I mean but you can see that how everybody had just the right job yeah like all the pieces came together just like they did in signs except that it was stupid Well, and it's maybe that he was trying to deal with such complexity. Like, we, I mean, we've talked often about how complex time travel and any kind Mm -hmm. of messing with the flow of time is. And building in a bunch of mental health situations and physical health situations, that always adds complexity because there's explanation that has to happen. And weird science things. Like, he's trying to build in, like, magnetism and... Like yeah, like big science concepts. And I maybe he was just trying to do too much in one movie. Possibly. And that everything feels chunky because it got trimmed down to be the length of a movie, but then you trimmed out all the things that were necessary to make anything make sense. Like, I think whole, the whole baby situation. Oh, that situation. Which in my notes I tagged as Blue Lagoon on speed. <laughs> But, like, the whole baby situation, like, was in- was interesting. There was a lot of potential there. Oh, my. But the way it was trimmed down, it didn't make any sense. <laughs> no. No. I-, I mean, I feel like the rules of the science here made no sense. Everything was arbitrary. And it's yeah. like a bag full of bones with ash falling out of them. And <sighs> this was yeah. nuts. And I feel like not... A lot of effort was put into trying to craft some cohesive kind of world to this. I mean, I think it's an impossible situation. Like, what's happening in the movie, this rapid aging without time actually passing quickly, doesn't make sense. You can't do that. (laughs) There were too many inconsistencies. Like, your cuts heal immediately, but then we're explaining that hair and nails aren't growing at a rapid Uh rate because they're dead, but then the dead bodies decompose decompose immediately. Like, none of it... Mm -hmm. There there was no consistency whatsoever. 
And I think they just wanted to have whichever parts they wanted to have. They're like, oh, this body's going to disappear real quick and yeah. that'll be fun. Yeah. To go a little deeper into the whole baby situation, those kids were six when they arrived at the beach. Yeah, they were. And I understand physically they were aging. So they were like appropriate ages for what happened physically. But that's some it, weird stuff. It's super weird. And the thing is, they went out of their way. They went out of their way to show Trent saying things that were very immature for his age. Yeah. Later. Much past that. Like he, well, even at that time, but like all throughout, he was constantly saying things that appropriately demonstrated he had not had the experiences of the world. Yeah. That someone his age would have. <sighs> Which causes me to have significant issues with the idea that these two kids who were six years old mentally would have had any of the reactions that they had to what was going on. Yeah, it was so messed up. Like, it, it's not really super inappropriate, but yet feels so wrong. Very much so. And... Like in really complicated ways. So mm -hmm. that one I was very, I, I was weirded out by. Then there was the point when they had mid-sized sedan. My name is mid-sized sedan and I'm a rapper <laughs> because I'm black. <laughs> We're not going to go into the like very obvious bias and racism in some of these characters. Yeah. But um, there was the point where mid-sized sedan is hitting on Maddox because Maddox now looks like she's like 18, 20, 21, somewhere yeah. like an appropriate age for him to be hitting on, despite the fact that she is 11 years old. Yeah. And like, it's one thing to have two six year olds who both now look like two 16 year olds doing some sexual exploration. Mm -hmm. Like, that's one thing. But a guy who started out as a full-grown adult hitting on someone who looks like she's almost legal, <laughs> but is still 11. Like, there are some. Yeah. That's gross. That was weird. I, I've just hung up on the pregnancy thing because <laughs> the biochemical processes, like, so the pregnancy was pass happening fast. Like, so this this baby's cells were dividing and growing. So... You know, in minutes, it was grown and born. Right. And yet, they didn't need to eat a pound a second of food. She did. Remember, well, she, got she came out of the tent and she, like, shoved face handfuls of pasta salad in her face? Because, like, they're explaining that kind of thing as, well, the, the young people, and in this case, the pregnant person, need food to produce this stuff. but To gain mass. Yeah, to gain mass or to make the baby gain mass, either way. That's all well and good, but, like, why is the process of the baby growing at the accelerated rate, and yet the process of digesting food and just living is not? Like, right, gaining you, you mass, can't do this You this can't way. treat gaining mass in one way, but then, like, completely disregard the metabolism necessary to keep a human body alive. Yeah. Yeah, right. That's That should be happening at light speed, too. Right. And, and and it did for the baby, yeah. which I mean, guess sort of made sense because the baby was rapidly gaining mass or should have been at that point. So it makes sense mm -hmm. that like not getting food was more important to an infant than it would have been to any of the rest of them. Yeah. But also, side note, they gave them one giant picnic basket <laughs> yeah. of food, knowing that this was going to happen. How did all of that food remain okay for them yeah. as time passed at like the rate of 50 years in one day yeah there was um it was wrapped you know like mres kind of like in you know silvery foil wrap like that was going to keep it good but it was fresh squishy pasta salad when she pulled it out and yeah. it had been 10 years at least yeah <laughs> and you're telling me that everybody sealed all of those things exactly right like yes Honestly, honestly, when we saw them open up the food and that the food was still perfectly good after, you know, 10 years, I was like, oh, 
so those like something about those insulated yeah. bags like I was oh about that. they're gonna create some kind of insulated suit out of those bags and that's yeah. how they're gonna escape like there was there was some potential there where i was like oh okay this yeah. is interesting and maybe that was they weren't just packed for freshness they were packed in lead lined things that protect them from the magic rocks of aging but the scientific exploration and analysis ability of this group as a collective was severely <laughs> lacking well that they wouldn't they they come up with ideas and then just not bother for sure they definitely came up with the idea of somebody slowly going back through and reacclimating to the regular time and then getting yeah. help only no one ever did that. They came up with the idea of swimming out and around and then didn't do it for another, like, 20 years. <laughs> in, in their time. In their yeah. time. Like, what are you waiting for? Yeah, it's so weird. Like, and then one of the arguments was, so it was the it was the cave going back to the real world that they couldn't go through because it was like... They would experience intense pressure and then magically reappear at the beach. And that was never explained. No. But it was supposed to be that, you know, like you couldn't handle the transition of time periods. And so they were saying, do it slowly. It's like dealing with the bends. But they were the argument against it was, you know, who's going to waste 20 years of their life trying that? And then they wasted 20 years of their life sitting on the beach, not trying it. So, right. Even at the very beginning, so Priska, the mom of these two kids, Trent and Maddox, her kids are 6 and 11 when they get there. So fairly rapidly, you see a significant difference in kids that age. Yeah. So she, like, sees her kids. A little bit later, she sees her kids again, and they look like they've aged five years. And she's like, what is happening? Only her response to this... Her reaction, the solution she thinks is necessary, is to take them to the hospital. <laughs> well, yeah, they've got some kind of disease. A virus. She kept saying they have some kind of virus. A virus that ages them. Like, what is happening? It wasn't even, oh, oh, I, I'm so angry about that that I still don't even have the words to explain it. <laughs> I mean, that kind of describes the whole thing. Yes. It really does. So I read... On IMDb that M. Night Shyamalan, he adapted this from a graphic novel, which I'm sure was much better. And it had to be. Yeah. And the reason he was so interested in doing it was that it was a way to explore, you know, the fears that he has that everybody probably feels about growing old. Because surprise, that's what the movie's about. And and ultimately about time going by so fast and not yes, and not taking out. advantage of it right like which like, they so didn't <laughs> which maybe was intentional right maybe, like just maybe to annoy us. because how many times has somebody in their lives been like oh i wish i could go back to school but i'm not going to because i'm already 40 years old and why would i waste the next six you know four years of my life going sure. to school well as the facebook meme says four years later you're still gonna be four years older, and you still won't have your degree. Like, we do that all the time. But uh, it just was so on the nose. It was, rather than feeling profound, it felt annoying. (laughs) I relate to this idea. We're always talking about how fast time is going. It's a huge thing. We're always talking about how we don't feel as old as we are. and like Which the movie mentioned. Yes. And, And how, like... On your deathbed, you're not going to care about this, that, or the other thing. And so it was all of those things sped up so that you could recognize them faster. Yeah. Only we already recognize those things. Yeah, everybody understands. You could have like a, a family drama about that where time is not going faster. It's just people, you know, regretting the fact that they didn't go to school four years ago. You know, like that's... There already are movies about that. (laughs) Well, I suppose that's what it is. He was trying to do something different. Yeah. And there's so much potential to that idea, I guess. But again, like, I sort of feel like maybe M. Night is kind of going the James Patterson route of writing. Where he's not actually writing it at all. 
He's like, I have some ideas. And then he's letting someone else write it. And whoever he picked, what? not doing the job. What? Well, here's an interesting thing. You know, I have heard and witnessed in movies like The Happening that he directs people to be very stoic and blah. Like he, he takes the energy out of them intentionally. For some reason, that's the movie he wants to make is that kind of Amish movie. <laughs> so he wants everyone to be Amish. And what's interesting in this movie is there's one person in this movie who is not being directed by M. Night Shyamalan. And it's the guy who drives them to the beach. Oh, and he's the best actor in the movie, which is funny because he's not a good actor. No, he's terrible. He is played by a guy named M. Night Shyamalan, mm. who is not mm. being directed because he can't be. And he has kind of naturalistic uh-huh. attitude and behavior. And no one else does. That's fascinating. Yeah. I, that is very interesting. I, it makes him the most lively guy in the movie. Which is, I mean, not saying much about no. the liveliness of the movie. But I, yeah, you're right. So I had one note about that cameo appearance. Uh-huh. M. Night Shyamalan, he's no Stephen King. He's no Stan Lee. Like, there are very few directors, <laughs> writers, whatever, who can get away with that, like, I'm always in my own movie because <laughs> yeah. it's a thing. No. Stay out of your own movie. Focus more on making the movie watchable. Yeah. That would that would have been an uh, improvement. Yeah. It was, I was annoyed to see his face. I mean, I don't. I think it's fine if it's like, a, like a Stan Lee cameo, you know, where ha ha, there he is, mm-hmm. and it's funny, but it's not important. It's just a little background yeah. thing. It's Here, like spot he, Stephen King as a bus driver. His role in this movie, it's not big, but he's a character. He's an actual person in the movie, and he has a bunch of lines, and he does stuff. He's one of the key characters. Yeah. I mean, he's not a huge role, but he's definitely yeah. a key player. And that's that's where it's. Over the line. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's not what a director cameo is about. Yeah. So at the end of the movie, it all kind of, all that point you were talking about, about growing old and stuff, is kind of just thrown aside for a completely different plot, which is this idea of an evil pharmaceutical company is tricking people into coming to this island so they can test medicine on them by you know, having them live out their lives really quick. Which again... Terrible science. Uh, terrible. So much of that made no sense. Because if... <laughs> it's the thing. If their metabolism was running fast enough, those drugs would be gone instantly. It wouldn't right. matter. And by so that metabolism, medication that stopped her seizures for 16 years? Yeah. That, there's, there's no actual way that could happen. Yeah. Does it last four minutes? Or does it last 16 years? And it, it, There's no way to reconcile that. It's yeah. maddening. But... You know, so they do that. So it's evil. It's murdering people. They even have like a, an uplifting speech by the pharmaceutical director going, you know, hey, let's have a moment of silence for these seven or eight or however many people who just died. But their sacrifices are going to save hundreds of thousands, maybe millions. And like, well, that's not really fair. They didn't choose to be sacrificed. No. And you can't shoehorn in a philosophical discussion about the differences between yes. individual rights and the good of society in like the last four minutes of a movie. Yeah, it, it's a completely different plot. It's totally irrelevant <laughs> to what we were doing. There's a political themey discussion thing to be had about, you know, pharmaceutical companies and how they all work. And in fact, at the beginning of the movie, there's some discussion of how this drug company has cheaper drugs or something. And, I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know what it means because it's a separate movie. <laughs> right. Also, that is like some some hardcore idealism, too, because they did say that, which answers my question. I had the question. They're talking about, oh, we're finding all these miracle drugs with, through this yeah. extremely unethical research. Uh, you know, he's like, we can save all of these lives. And my note was like, at a cost, right? Yeah, like it's not good. You're not going to just give these away because pharmaceutical companies are notorious <laughs> for jacking up prices for yeah. miracle drugs, right? And so at the beginning, setting it up that this company is actually giving away these miracle medications at reasonable prices yeah, is, which is nonsense. complete nonsense. The kind of people who would murder people to test their stuff are going to 
charge the most they can and try to right? make as much money as possible. And who own their own island and have to yeah. like staff it and do all of these things and conduct all of this With research. A secret resort. Yeah. No, this company was would make the the EpiPen folks look reasonable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that twist at the end was just all the more upsetting because of that. Yeah. My political take on this movie comes from the end where Trent and Maddox, who are now like in their 60s, are looking so self-satisfied at having brought down this entire pharmaceutical company that has been conducting these unethical research programs. It should have had a high five and a freeze frame. That is how, yes, that is how it was. And it all happened in like the course of half an hour. Yeah. Like, so what that made me think of is how how caught up in individualism and speed we are when it comes to political activism. So many people, especially middle-aged, middle-class white political activists, think that there is something that they can do that's going to suddenly end racism Mm -hmm. or suddenly protect all of the rights. And we get so caught up in that that we forget how important it is to collaborate with others. And we forget that compromise is a part of the solution. And I am not talking about minority activists compromising to be able to be acceptable to join, you know, the, the wealthy organizations trying to do good. I'm talking about the rest of us, those of us in power, compromising to listen and and trust the people who have been most deeply impacted by the decisions that have been made by us over the last 200 years. So um, it just it really brought out that idea for me that we all think we are like superheroes in our own minds. And that's not it. There are no superheroes to save us today. We have to work with actual human beings. And then we have to think of ourselves as just regular human beings. Yeah. Well, and it, it leads to kind of the flip side where because we aren't superheroes, you try to do something like sign a petition or whatever, and nothing happens. And you think, well, I can't do anything. Right. It's oh, hopeless. I did what I could. I don't have this power that I see yeah. in movies, so I have no power. Absolutely. And those two beliefs that I should be able to do this alone, and if I don't accomplish it in a month of trying, mm-hmm. it's unaccomplishable. Like Those two beliefs are what are holding us back from actually causing, bringing about change. And the idea that... Once I have solved a problem, it will be solved forever. (laughs) Yeah, that's not great. Ratings. So also, we watched a movie. It was called Old. And how would you rate it? I'm struggling. Uh, Yeah. Because this is our first movie in quite some time. And I always feel like my ratings are a little like off at first till I get into the groove of it. And I want to give this movie a one. It feels wrong to start off with a score that's like that dramatic because, you know, we tend to be a little judicious with our ones and fives. I'm going to give this movie a one and a half. Very high. And I don't actually know why I'm giving it that half point, except that I'm, I'm acknowledging that perhaps... I'm being overly critical because it's the first review I've done in a while. <laughs> Lucky movie, really. I just... I I can't pinpoint anything that I really thought was valuable in this movie. And I don't think I would suggest anyone watch this movie, except perhaps for the pleasure of hate-watching it. That's what I was thinking. And even that, there are better movies to hate watch. Yeah, I think you could definitely watch clips. Like, just 
individual yes. moments of this movie are just hilarious. Yes. And there's nothing, there's no benefit you get from watching all of those <laughs> in order with all the bits in between because it's not yeah. going to make any more sense if you watch the whole thing than if you just watch the clips. True. So, yeah, I'm I'm giving this a 1.5. How about you? All right. Well, that's easy. I'm giving it a 1 because it was <gasps> absolutely terrible. <laughs> I mean, this is one of the worst movies I've ever seen, but not a zero. I mean, there was it was a movie. Yeah, no, zeros zeros are reserved for movies that are so offensive that I I I wish I could make them unexist. Yeah. This doesn't need that. It's shockingly bad. Like there's it is bad. 50s sci-fi black and white movies with way better dialogue and more realistic acting. Yes. It's I don't even know how this happened. True story. All right. Well, so that was an interesting place to start. It's all uphill from here. <laughs> Fight the horror of a world gone mad. Today's discussion tip is all about how we cannot solve the problems of the world alone. And we can't do it overnight. So my suggestion, if you would like to fight the horrors of the world today, is that you join up with others in your area who are fighting the same fight. And I would like to remind you that those people do not have to have exactly the same opinions that you have about every single issue. That's important. They don't need to be the same flavor of whatever political belief system you are. And they don't even need to be people you like on a personal level. We have to work together. And that means joining political groups. That means putting together friend groups for accountability. That means joining organizations that support issues that are important to you. Because you have to have support and you have to have somebody holding you accountable to action. Talking yeah. is not enough. That sounds good to me. It's hard. It is hard. It's exhausting, but we can't stop. Not if we want to survive the horror. So that's the end of our review for Old from 2021. As we close this out, I would like to know what from this movie is going to stick with you forever. <laughs> I mean, there's not a lot that isn't, but my favorite line in this entire movie is, you know, the rapid agent's happening, and they have a little dog. So obviously the dog dies very quickly. And someone says, oh, this dog's dead. And the guy who owns the dog goes, but he was only just alive. <laughs> as, if, yes. as if that's not the definition of dead. <laughs> like, <laughs> if he wasn't just alive, he would, he would have been already dead. That's, that's the only option. But he was only just alive. Yeah. Yeah. That was that was one of the better lines in the movie. Do you have something you're taking with you from this one? I think the thing that is going to stick with me forever from this movie is that when that six-year-old turned 16-year-old, however old she was, was giving birth, she was wearing the bottoms to her swimsuit the entire time. Yes. <laughs> yep. Just. Just that. That's just, just that's that. going to be in my brain forever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was the whole tumor removal, too, and we don't have the time. No. We'll have to see you guys next week with a movie that makes sense. Oh, one can hope. <laughs> okay. Bye, everyone. Don't forget to contact your elected representatives. And we'll catch you on the flippity flop. Boo. <laughs>